Welcome back to part two of the video where we're talking about the Alpha 7 III and the Alpha 7 R3. Let's talk about focusing because people look at the different focusing modes and go, ah, there's too many of them. What do I choose? It's actually not that complicated. It's just a matter of size and position. To get to the focusing mode, you hit the function button and then you head over to focus area right there. On the focus area, you have a lot of choices. You can scroll up and down. Um, I'm going to start with the one that's a factory default. It's called wide and it makes the best decisions and the greatest variety of situations. Basically, the heuristics it uses are one, it'll focus on whatever's closest. If you take away whatever's closest, it'll focus what's ever closest. The only override to that is if it recognizes a face. Here's a Sears portrait special. I'll put that right over here, and I don't even have to press the button on the camera. If it recognizes the face, that takes priority. Otherwise, whatever's closest takes priority, and there you go. So that's an easy thing to do. Now, what do all the other settings do? In situations where the camera is not making the right choice, sometimes it pays to constrain the area in which the camera looks. So for the choices here, we have a wide zone, which is essentially, you see the size of the box. Zone is like really, really large, and you can move it anywhere in the frame you want to. But if that's too big, you can make it even smaller. For example, you have something called center, which is that, and you can't move it. Or you can have something called flexible spot, which is just like center, except you can move it around like that using the multi-selector. If that size isn't right, when you're choosing a flexible spot, you can hit the right and left arrows and choose between three different sizes. This one here is large. It's just a little bit larger. Or you can go with the smaller. There's the smallest. Still not enough for you. There's something called expanded effect flexible spot, which goes all over the screen. So it's a matter of position. It's a matter of size. And that's about it. I almost never use these modes where we have to move things around because I think it slows me down, even with the multi-selector, which is very handy. For 30 years, I've been doing the spot focus in the center, recompose, and shoot method. And that's pretty much how I have my, configured, my camera configured here. So 99% of the time, I have my focus area set to wide. So the camera will try to make it its best choice. And if it fails, if it's not it's not concentrating on what I think it should concentrate on, I can instantly override it by hitting the center button. What's the center button? The center button I've previously assigned to something called focus standard. Here it is, camera two, page eight, custom key, center button, where is it, control wheel? There it is, center button, focus standard. What in the world does that do? It does two different things. When you press it, it automatically takes you what out of whatever mode you're in, most of the time I'm in AFC mode, where the uh, camera is constantly reevaluating the distance between the camera and the subject, and it thinks the subject is moving, and it constantly tries to refocus. Great when shooting kids or sports, but when you press focus standard, it instantly goes to AFS, and it instantly goes from wide area autofocus, where it will decide what the subject is, no matter where it is in the frame, and it says, and it just goes to the center. So in an emergency situation where the camera is not making the right choice, I just put my subject in the center, press the center button and say, see that? That's my subject. Focus on it. Then I can just recompose and shoot. And there you go. So it's less than a one second override. I don't have to move any spot focusing areas around. That's the way I've been shooting for a long, long time. And for that reason, that's that and wide area AF are the only focusing modes that I use. Now there's another focusing mode on the bottom of the menu, which requires a little bit of explanation. Hit the function button, go to focus area, and it's the very last one down there. Lock on AF. And then you can use the left and right arrow buttons to choose which version of lock on AF. And it has all the choices that you saw up above. Uh, the zone, the center, the flexible spot, different sizes, Expandable flexible spot and, of course, the wide, which we started with. What does that do? It works exactly like wide area autofocus, except if your subject is moving, it will automatically try to track it as it goes across the frame. To wit, I'm going to press the shutter release button halfway. It'll find the closest thing that's not a face. And while I keep my finger on the button, I'm going to try to move it across the frame here and here. And it recognizes it and tries to track it. Not bad. 
Is it always perfect? No. Can it keep up with a bullet? No. It might do pretty well with a soccer player, though. Now, there's actually two different kinds of subject tracking features in the camera. This is the one that's good for stills, but it cannot be used for movies. There is a version that can be used for movies, and it's called Center Lock on AF. That's very confusing. I agree. But here's how to access it, and here's how to use it. You can find it in camera menu one and go all the way to, I think it's the sixth page. There it is, center lock on AF. Notice it's grayed out. How come? Oh, it's incompatible with the one I just showed you, the lock on AF, which only works with stills. Okay, let's go back and disable that. Feature, sorry, function, lock on AF wide. Let's just go to focus area wide which has served me very well for many years. Let's go back to the menu now. Center lock on AF is now enableable, and I'm gonna turn it on. Now, once that happens, you get instructions on the screen. It says, tracks the nearest subject. You put your subject in the center, and then you tell the camera, that's my subject right there. You press the center button. You're telling the camera, that's my subject, track it. And what the camera looks at is contrast and color as it tries to move from here to there. This is great for actors on a stage as they walk back and forth around the stage. Not great for anything that moves very quickly. This is even questionable in terms of sports. But it was the first and it's good for movie mode. What I never liked about this was the fact that it was a two-step operation. You had to tell the camera first, this is my subject, track it. With a newer lock-on AF, which only works when this is off, so let's, let's turn this off now. Center lock AF off. There we go. And then let's put our lock on AF back on again. Go to the bottom. There it is. Here, you don't have to tell the camera this is my subject. It uses the same heuristics that it normally uses to determine a subject. Whatever's closest or whatever's a face. And then it uses that. It automatically determines that's my subject. And it... So there are lots of different ways for you to tell the camera this is what I want you to focus on. And as I mentioned earlier, I only use two. Wide area AF or lock on wide area AF or the focus standard, which is my subject is in the center, focus on that, and then recompose and shoot. Done. Metering. A lot of different metering modes, too. Let me start with the one that's a factory default, which in my mind is the most useful, and it makes the best decisions in the greatest number of circumstances. Let's see here. Uh, hit the function button. The metering mode icon is on the right here. And you have lots of different choices. This one's called Entire Screen Average, and it takes you back to the 1950s. Let's you assume that you were a Nikon F2AS user. They weren't too sophisticated back then. Back then, all cameras were designed with the assumption that your subject has an average reflectivity. An average subject will reflect back, on average, 18% of the light that hits it. The camera has no idea that you're shooting a bride in a white dress or a groom in a black tux. It only knows i thinking average, average scene reflects back. I'm going to make sure that this average scene looks 18% gray if you were to convert it to a black and white image. And that's kind of how it works. Let me use this visual aid here. This is a uh, nice little LED display. And I'm going to put it in front of average. Now with average, it takes everything together and averages the exposure. So no matter how much you move this around, it's not going to change much unless you do that. Now... This is now taking up a prominent amount of the screen, and it's now biasing the exposure for that. Now let me go the opposite. By the way, this is pretty much obsolete. I don't recommend you use it ever. Let's do the opposite of that. I'm going to use the spot metering mode. You can see it here, spot standard. Now see that little tiny circle in the very center? The camera is only going to pay attention to that and ignore everything else. Thusly, I'm going to move this right outside the circle, no problem at all. The minute the light gets into that circle, that's what it pays attention to when it determines exposure. It's very absolute. This is useful when you're shooting non-average subjects, specifically if you have an actor on stage and they're spotlit and there's a really black background. Well, your average exposure meter is going to average all that together and you'll blow out your, your performer and the background won't be black at all. It'll be gray. With this, you just spot meter for your performer. It'll expose just for the performer and ignore everything else. So those are two of the metering modes. Spot metering is very useful for very, very challenging light. What are the other modes for? Well, 
there's something a little bit less stringent than the spot metering mode. It's called center weighted. And again, this is what Nikon was using after the uh, F2AS was obsoleted. It's kind of like spot metering, but it's not as absolute. Things in the corners don't count for as much as the center, but there's no circle with a fixed boundary. It just gets gradually more sensitive in the center and gradually less when you get to the end. The thinking here is your subject is probably not going to be in the very corners. So it places a greater emphasis in the center rather than the edges. This did a good job, but whoever thought of this never knew about the rule of thirds. Anyway, this also is kind of obsolete. What Nikon first did in the 1980s was to develop a kind of metering that would work better in a greater variety of circumstances. They called it matrix metering, and it first appeared on the Nikon FA. And here's the way it worked. It would divide the frame into several different sections and then meter for all those. And then inside the camera was a little tiny lookup table. It says, if you ever see a light distribution that looks like this, you must be backlit. So to fix that, overexposed by three quarters of a stop, and you should be okay. Um, and everybody else has copied that brilliant technique. Canon calls it evaluative metering. Sony calls it multi-segment metering. And essentially, instead of having five different zones, it's like every single pixel in the camera is its own zone. So it works very, very well, and it makes the best decisions in the greatest number of circumstances. Do I use all these other metering modes that you see here? No, I don't. Why not? Because, like I mentioned in the first part of the video, I only choose two. One where I let the camera do whatever it wants to do because the automation of these things are really incredible. And two, I can instantly override the camera in case I think it's making a wrong choice. And that's kind of what I do here. It's in multi-segment metering mode all the time unless it makes a mistake, in which case I have this AEL button reassigned. What do I have it reassigned to? I'll show you. Uh, screen 8, custom key, AEL button, and it's set to something called AEL toggle. What does that do? Well, it instantly takes it from multi-segment metering, where it's looking at everything, to spot metering. Instantly, spot metering. I will press it for you. I'm actually going to fill the frame with my subject. Press the AEL button. There we go. Now, two things just happened. You see the star in the lower right-hand corner? That means the exposure is locked. And you can't see it now, but I'm going to move it over here. The spot metering had appeared. I pressed one button, and it went from multi-second metering to spot metering, and it went from, and, and then it locked it. Two separate things, one button press. So in case the camera's not making the right choice, I can instantly override it by putting my stuff to the center, hitting the button, focus, recompose, and shoot. Again, another way to very quickly override the camera in case its awesome automation is not doing the best job. All right, there's one more metering mode that I haven't gone over yet. Let me show that to you now. Uh, hit the function button, and the last metering mode down there is something called highlight. Now, again, this is another relatively new one. Here's what it does. Remember I mentioned that this was great for theater work, where the subject is spotlit and your background is black? That's exactly what this is for, except you don't have to put the center of the camera over your subject and then hit the AEL button. It will automatically search everywhere inside your frame and it will pick the brightest part of the frame and expose only for that. That's pretty cool. Now this only works for theater where they have a black background and a spotlit person. If the background is brighter than the person, obviously it's going to expose for the brightest part of the image, not your subject, not going to work there. But if you do a lot of theater shooting, this can make things very, very easy for you. Just put it on this and it'll just expose for whatever's in the brightest, regardless of where it is in the picture. So that's pretty much a summary of all the metering modes, all the focusing modes, and of course the customization. If you found this tutorial useful, you might also enjoy the books I've written on these cameras. And you can find it right over here, freebunarchives.com slash ebooks. Thanks so much for watching, and enjoy exploring the world with your cameras.